Good afternoon, Cedarfield family. Happy Tuesday, May 5th at the Prairie Block. Thank you for tuning in. If you're here on campus uh, doing this live, and thank you to the Cedarfield family, uh, loved ones, and powers of attorney responsible parties, uh, near and far, who are viewing this uh, tonight. I first just want to start off with an apology. In the beginning of March, when this pandemic uh, started to surface around the United States and retirement communities like Cedarfield started to ramp up their preparedness plan, our, our team here uh, made a commitment, and the commitment was threefold before this even started. It was one, to try as best we can to connect every resident to our nine domains of well-being. That was our first objective. Our second objective was to implement the best evolving preparedness plan to keep people safe, alive, and healthy. And then the third objective was to balance transparency with privacy and confidentiality. So I have been and I will continue to remain committed to providing very timely, accurate information to ensure the health and well-being of every resident and every team member during this continued worldwide uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So my apology is this. Yesterday, my absence was not indicative of a cover-up. I did receive 22 texts, emails, or phone calls that he's not communicating, and therefore he must be covering something up. I didn't need to alarm anybody, and I apologize. The simple truth, absent facts and knowledge, people may make up stories, the simple truth is, and I'm not boasting when I say the following, that from Saturday evening through Monday morning, I was here on this campus, and I worked a total of 44 hours. And 32 of them were straight without any sleep. I don't say that to boast. This is my job at Cedarfield. But those were the facts. So yesterday, I had, I had to go to sleep. <laughs> I left the campus around 1 o'clock. Um, I actually took a short nap. I came back at 3 o'clock. Um, and then at 5, I was just done. So I didn't have any energy to do the live stream. So I apologize if I alarmed anybody. Um, I apologize to those of you that heard maybe rumors around the campus that since we had a point prevalence survey last week, we haven't heard from Michael in three days. There must be something going on. I apologize for an unnecessary alarm around the community. Facts are important. So I encourage everyone, if you sense a story that may not seem right to you, I would encourage you to please call the administration suite. Our doors are always open. We try to Return calls very timely, get a concern or comment in, instead of maybe spreading untruths around the community. Please just call our office and Renee and I will be as transparent as we possibly can. So, second um, on our agenda today has to do with uh, Virginia Governor Press uh, briefing. Yesterday, I just want to highlight on a couple of those items since uh, A, we didn't have the live stream yesterday, and B, in the events that you did not have a chance to view Governor Northam's uh, briefing yesterday, it does have some infor information in it that applies to Cedar Field. So he did talk, um, again, he wanted to thank. All Virginians for the last 10 weeks, I can't believe we've been in this for 10 weeks now. 10 weeks we learned two new terms that we all know very well now. 
social distancing or physical distancing. He talked a lot about what we have learned and what we have implemented here in the last 10 weeks, mainly a very healthy PPE, personal protective equipment supply chain. He talked about ramping up alternative um, care systems. He talked about other preparedness plans that the Commonwealth of Virginia has done a great job of, and I concur with him. We have done a great job in the state preparing for this pandemic, despite the tremendous cost and sacrifice to all of us, mainly people who live in congregated settings such as Cedarfield. The truth is the virus is not going to go away until we have a vaccine. And so we need to, we really need to move into these next couple of phases with extreme caution and uh, determine what's the best course of action in those phases so that we don't have another outbreak uh, here at Cedarfield. He did talk about phase one and perhaps maybe opening phase one, um, commencing phase one next week. A couple of bullet points that I noted uh, when I was listening to him. Um, again, we're safer at home uh, for the next several weeks. He talked about no social gatherings in phase one, um, continue to talk about continued social distancing, face coverings while we're in public. He talked about implementing policies that keep everybody separated. So as we see businesses start to open up restaurants and barber shops, beauty, uh, beauty shops, how those uh, places of business will have to comport with policies to make sure people are safe and separated. He talked a lot about cleaning and disinfecting policies that small business owners or even a cedar field must comply with. And then he talked a lot about enhanced workplace uh, safety. So next week, we probably will see the opening of some restaurants, uh, again, our places of worship, beauty and barber shops, uh, the gyms shall be opening back up, all within a probably a two to three week phase. I think he was considering phase one, about a two to three week phase, and, and doing it in incremental steps with certain policies in place. Um, so that's kind of phase one. Phase two, he did talk a little bit more about staying at home for the vulnerable population, which are those residents that uh, live at Cedarfield in retirement communities. He talked a little bit more about no social gathering, gatherings for more than 50 people, and um, continued social distancing, and then everyone should really continue to wear a face mask in the public. He talked a lot about phase two, again, being a two to three week period of time. And then he briefly talked about phase three, uh, again, with a two to three week period of time. So if we take those three phases, we're talking about potentially about a nine week uh, redeployment or reopening of the economy, which leads Cedarfield into preparedness plan, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit about how we intend to reopen Cedarfield. And then lastly, he talked about testing. Testing uh, continues to be on the rise, mainly because of the amount of tests that have been performed here over the last week. Um, confirmed cases continue to rise. Uh, he talked a little bit about the seven-day average of the, uh, of the percentage of tests that are positive, which is one of probably the number one uh, benchmark that they're following. He talked a lot about the downward trend over a 14-day uh, period of confirmed tests. One of the stats that I found most interesting was he, over this past weekend, uh, we went from on average 3,000 tests being performed per day 
to 6,000 per day. So this past Saturday and Sunday around the Commonwealth, a total of almost 12,000 tests were performed. Last the weekend prior uh, was half of that, or 6,000. Then he talked a lot about the downward trend of uh, over 14 days of uh, hospitalizations, and particularly because we opened up hospitals uh, for elective uh, surgeries. So we're really going to concentrate on what that utilization is in the hospitals. So in the governor's opinion, he and his uh, cabinet are really looking for metrics uh, day by day and, and rolling averages uh, to see if the virus is stabilized, utilizing a lot of the, uh, of the benchmarks that I just mentioned. So that is the governor's uh, remarks. If anybody has any questions about that, um, please feel free to call the administration suites and uh, we will answer your uh, questions just as soon as we can. Second thing I just want to talk about is our point prevalence survey from last Thursday. Uh, we did issue a memo, uh, Renee and her army of people delivering memos. Um, hopefully you put that memo or you've received uh, that memo in your cottage, independent living apartment, or the licensed side of the campus assisted living. Everyone should have that memo. We posted this memo on our website and on our www.mycedarfield.com uh, touchdown. So hopefully families that are listening to this tonight can go on to Touchdown and read that memo as well. But just to, to highlight uh, the memo, last Thursday, April 30th, we, along with the Department of Health and their partners, uh, the Virginia National Guard, spent really much of the day here um, at Cedarfield completing what I call phase one of a point prevalence survey. And as part of that PPS, uh, the National Guard um, completed three main things. First, they administered the COVID-19 test for 27 residents in the healthcare uh, center, the South and Central neighborhood. The second thing they did is they helped administer COVID-19 testing for 75 team members and agency personnel who work uh, in the healthcare center in that south and central neighborhood. And then the third thing they did, which is probably the more important piece of the three for me, listening to these experts around Cedarfield, helping us guide uh, decision making around this preparedness plan. The third most important thing is that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sam led a team of two other individuals who are also RNs and met with Connie McGowan, our infection control director. And they reviewed our preparedness plan. They reviewed our infection control policies. They reviewed the Henrico County epidemiologist report uh, from their April 20th uh, site visit. They reviewed our infection control assessment tools of what we do to actually assess the preparedness plan. They went on a tour of the community to look at our cohorting strategy. We talked at length about cohorting uh, here on this live stream. And then lastly, the most important piece of this third objective is they for the community that incorporated a very intensive survey to ensure that the team members and the agency folks are utilizing the personal protective equipment and that they're doming and doffing, putting on and removing that equipment properly. They looked at utilization and then they looked at infection control standards to make sure that our preparedness plan and our policies were actually being implemented 
on the floor. And so that's an overview of what happened last Thursday. Prior to April 30th, last Thursday, we had a total of five residents that tested positive for COVID-19. Three of them tested positive in the uh, health center, South Central neighborhood. And then two of those five were in independent living in the main building. So this morning, just this morning, I received the formal report from uh, the Enrico uh, Health Department. We received the results and I compiled them at uh, 8 o'clock this morning. And the test results are as follows. So of that, of that point prevalence survey, of the 27 that we uh, tested, three came back positive for COVID-19. And 24 residents were tested negative for the virus. So if there's any good news out of that PPS, zero of those residents that were tested were, 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 were asymptomatic, meaning our surveillance tools that we have every shift are picking up people who are exhibiting symptoms. And we're doing it very timely. So there were zero residents who were asymptomatic, or another way of saying that, that were tested and were confirmed positive and yet we're not exhibiting any symptoms. So that's a ray of sunshine in our surveillance uh, each shift. Of the 75 team members that were tested, three of them were tested positive for COVID-19, and 65 tested negative for the virus, while seven of the results were invalid for some reason. So we're going to connect with those seven resident or team members and let them know what, they, what their next steps are. Again, zero of those team members who tested positive were asymptomatic. The three people who were tested positive, they have been out since Monday of last week. So they started telling us that they were exhibiting signs and we told them to stay home. So no test came back positive from Thursday's event that otherwise people were asymptomatic. So I hope that might give you, while it's not good news that we had other confirmed cases, I hope that gives you more good news that um, our surveillance systems are working and we're catching the people and more people are coming out full, full right to tell us when they're exhibiting symptoms. And we're doing the appropriate thing to protect the team member, and more importantly, protect the vulnerable uh, residents on that floor. So residents who have tech, oh, let me go back for a second. So, any keeps in my notes? So here's a snapshot of what we've been saying over the last two weeks. This gives us a cumulative uh, number. So we have had, to date, we have had 42 residents tested. Now, eight of them have tested positive for COVID-19. Of the eight residents, two of these still remain in independent living. And that six, six of them are in, uh, Actually, four of them are in uh, our healthcare area, and they're all confined to one little location um, on the south neighborhood. The team members, here's our team member total. So, 75 team members were tested through our point prevalence survey. 
And actually, this number is wrong. I need to change it to 83. 83 team members were tested over the last week. 75 of them, of which were tested last Thursday. And eight team members um, had tested positive for COVID-19. If anybody needs any clarity about those uh, data points, then please feel free to call down to the administration suite and we will clarify uh, your questions. Residents who have tested positive um, have been isolated in their healthcare room and team members are utilizing the proper personal uh, equipment and technique uh, to care for those residents. Residents who test negative will also be continued to isolate in their healthcare area uh, as we were doing even prior to testing to ensure that we are protecting the residents. Team members who test positive have been asked to um, self-quarantine for 14 days from the date that they were tested and they must be retested with uh, negative results and accompanied by a physician order to return to work. So again, the good news from, I know everyone, the most frequently asked question is, Michael, is, is, somebody, is somebody from uh, your staff that's bringing it into the community? And I wanna caution people, let me get back to that for a second. Uh, the three people who were tested positive last Thursday, they were out for four prior days. So they're actually, today, they're working on being out of the campus for one week already. So they're already halfway through their quarantine, um, uh, their quarantine period. Just one word of caution. I hear the following, I hear it often. Somebody from your staff, Michael, brought this disease into Cedarville. So it might be natural to try to look for blame. I can assure you that we, along with the Department of Health, went through a source tracing and a root cause analysis to try to pinpoint where it came from. And in our opinion, this little slippery virus we're not quite sure how or even when it came in. We know when we tested our first residents, and we sourced, traced the team members who were in and around that resident 14 days prior to when that resident first started exhibiting symptoms. But remember, this disease was first identified in December, and this is just me speaking. I have a sneaky suspicion that COVID-19 was around the world long before the summer. And so just because we shut down certain things, mainly the health center on a specific date not too long ago, doesn't mean that only team members who are accessing that floor could have brought that disease to Cedarville. The disease was really around the world back in December, in January, in February, and in March, and not until the beginning of March did the federal government and state officials and Cedarville take precautions to, to ramp up our preparedness plans. If you all could help me help the people who continue to work here and boost them around, the team members and the agency folks, I would strongly caution everybody to not try to look for blame on one of my staff or the, the people who work at Cedarville currently and have been working for the last eight weeks at Cedarville. Even though we have, uh, we have cohorted our neighborhoods and we've placed restrictions on the campus. We just don't know where it came from. So it's imperative, as I have stressed in a couple of uh, memos before, that we continue to be vigilant, uh, as I 
place a couple of phone calls to some residents today. If, if you deem it critically essential to your health and well-being, and you want to get outside and walk, please enjoy Mother Nature. It, it is really nice outside today. Please do that for your health. You are not locked in your apartment. We are not in lockdown mode right now. Um, if you are leaving your apartment, I strongly encourage you to wear your mask going through the hallways and into the outside. If you get to outside and you want to take that mask off and breathe in that fresh air, uh, please feel free to do so. If any resident, if any family member, loved one, power attorney, if anyone has any questions related to this memo that we posted today, please feel free to call the administration suite tomorrow or tonight, and we will answer uh, your questions just as soon as we can. Uh, Renee and I will make it a priority over the next uh, eight hours or so through tomorrow to uh, get it back to everyone very timely. Uh, this next little segment is for families near and far. If you um, are here locally in the Richmond area and are dropping off supplies to the residents of Cedarfield, uh, those that uh, live in independent living um, apartments, thank you for dropping off items today. And the residents are very grateful for this program. On Wednesday, we'll kick back up uh, the supply shuttle program for residents that live in the cottage. This is a little construction update. Uh, today, as we mentioned last week, we were going to move forward with repaving the court. Uh, the court being the cottages off to the right hand side after you pass the gatehouse. Um, our objective, the, the contractor had three cedar field objectives. One was to deliver us a great quality product. Two, do it as quick as possible. And three, when the residents come outside of their cottages and want to ask you questions, please be pleasant to them and answer all of your answer all of their questions. You might be the only person that they talk to in uh, in that day. So if you could make it an extra effort to just connect with them and talk with them about the process. I know many of them will probably have lots of questions. And indeed, that's what happened. Many residents in the courts went out and asked questions. Here's some pictures of that three-day project. And it was quick. It was a three-day project, and they finished it yesterday. They started and finished the project yesterday. Here's a, a look at what, what the paving uh, looked like after they rebuilt. Here's a couple of uh, pieces of equipment on along the courts. Here's them laying down uh, new blacktop. And then there's our final product. It really looks great. Um, they were very professional. They many I had seven residents comments today on how not only professional they were, but how friendly they were, how gregarious they were. They took the time to answer residents' questions. Um, and so good quality product, quick, and uh, friendly and pleasant to the residents. This is the company that also helped us with the 14 new parking space in Dallas Front. And uh, we really appreciated their quality of that project. So this is their second project. And by all indications, they will help us continue to repave the entire, um, entire campus over a phase plan over the next several months. Mrs. McCalsey, he's 
all these photos are uh, courtesy of Vivian. So thank you, Vivian, for uh, taking such great pictures for us to give all of us a snapshot of what happened yesterday. So one of, one of the most frequently asked questions is since the governor yesterday talked about a phasing plan, uh, we have answered many phone calls today about what is Cedar Field's phasing plan to reopen. And we are going to utilize uh, some of the We're going to utilize some of the, the governor's uh, comments and uh, phasing plan items from yesterday. Uh, we have, uh, as a team, we are going to meet a few times this week uh, to talk about what does a new norm look like at Cedarfield. We cannot, as Dr. Fauci, I think, has often said this is not like turning on a switch. And it's definitely not like turning on a switch at a community like Cedarfield, where the most vulnerable to COVID-19 live. And so we need to develop a plan. We're going to develop a plan with all of the services and amenities in mind about how to reopen Cedarfield. So again, the, the team is going to meet a couple of times this week and talk, begin to talk about how, house, how we're going to open up housekeeping, probably the most important, followed by the dining venues, the beauty shop, this beautiful pathways to wellness building, and what is that, and what does that plan look like, what's the timeline, and then when we open different pieces, of uh, Cedarfield, different amenities and services, what are the policies within those amenities that we have to comport with because there is no vaccine yet? And so we want to be very smart in how we do this to make sure that we're protecting everybody and that we don't um, have another outbreak at the campus. So that's our that's our plan this, this week to Again, talk about our new norm, to talk about what, uh, what's, what does stability look like and sustainability. The other thing I have, we have to take into consideration is team members who work at Cedarfield. There's a variety of reasons why people are or are not working at Cedarfield right now. And we have to piece that team back together over the next several weeks. So people who might have come off of FMLA, some people who may be working from home, some people who have been working for the last 12 weeks need a vacation. And so in this basic plan of bringing Cedarfield back online, we need to take all of those things into consideration as well and come up with a new norm of how we intend to operate a community until a vaccine is uh, approved and widely available for people 65 years of age and better. So we're going to talk about that reopening. I call it the planning phase. We're going to we're going to start planning uh, this week, and so look for more information uh, to come about what um, a phasing plan looks like um, in the early part of next week. If anybody has any suggestions of what a phasing plan should look like around certain amenities, we are all ears. We're not the experts on this. So if you have any suggestions, please feel free to email me. It would probably be the best. Type it up, send me an email. Send an email to any of the department directors. Let them know what your thoughts are on um, different amenities or services that they're responsible for. And we'll take all of that information together and we'll, we'll, we will come up with a plan that um, is collated and taking the best ideas and, um, and putting it together. If anybody has any questions, 
Feel free to uh, text him right now, and you will. Renee's shaking her head. No, I don't have any yet. We'll leave that up. We'll leave that up for a couple of minutes. Last thing before I call Trish Carter up. Um, this is Nurses Week, so starting tomorrow. So to the residents of Cedarfield, all the nurses who live here, to the family members who are listening tonight that are nurses, and to certainly the nurses that work here as part of our Cedarfield team, um, or agency folks that come on uh, to the campus, whether you're an LPN or an RN, we celebrate you this week. It is a gift from God of what you do. A gift that only a small fraction of people in the world possess. Make no mistake about it, we, we, we wrote a memo this week. You are like soaring eagles placed here at Cedarfield to inspire, to guard the residents, to manifest well-being, and to offer wisdom. You spread your wings fully to any project or adventure, and yet nearly always manage to keep one foot on the ground. You are caregivers, you are communicators, you are resident advocates and decision makers. You are hand holders, you are voices of reason, you are the 3 a.m. Michael checkers. You, come, you become the round the clock best friend of the resident by the bedside. You're the calming voice and you're the familiar face of compassion. Whether your vocation is in the health center, whether it's in assisted living, whether it's in memory support, whether it's in healthy hands, or the clinic, nurses have bad days too. Some of them are just due to the physical, physical exhaustion of the day, or how emotionally draining it is to care for so many people. Yet you let those difficulties be outweighed by the satisfaction knowing that you play a pivotal role in the resident's life. You are handling this unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic with agility, with grace and professionalism, your strength and endurance to navigate our rough waters during these times, please, I know me in all and in many. When we need to improve our perspective from a higher vantage point, we turn to you. We turn to our nurses to help us make sound choices. We just want to say thank you for bringing the best of yourself every day and lifting up our spiritual mission. We honor your divine nursing role and express our sincere, sincere gratitude and appreciation for all of you, for what all of you do. A famous quote came to mind over the last couple of days as many of us were writing this memo that uh, nurses will receive tomorrow, and it goes something like this. We should all go through life like soaring eagles, not to look down on people, but to give people a reason to look up. On behalf of all of the residents that we serve and the teams that you lead, thank you nurses for all that you do. We appreciate you and we absolutely look up to you. Every day. Happy Okay, with that in mind, I have Trish Carter who has some spiritual words of well being. Good afternoon, Cedarfield. I have three communications today. The first is particularly for the family members who may be watching later. 
Sunday is Mother's Day, and you may know that I am collecting photos, preferably in digital format, so that they may be added to a slideshow which will air Sunday morning following the worship service. That will be approximately 10.30. The service starts at 10. We will also put the slideshow on our app. But please do send in some photos. We've had some wonderful contributions so far. This project grew out of the need to do something for mothers when we can't send flowers. So please send in any photos of children, grandchildren, with or without flowers. Secondly, I would like to share with you a Kenyan prayer from the cowardice that dare not face new truth, from the laziness that is contented with half-truth, from the arrogance that thinks it knows all truth, good Lord, deliver me. And now, for some good news, this beautiful young lady is Anne Gregory Smith, and she has turned 13 years old today. She is celebrating with the Zoom party with family and friends. And for those of you who have not yet heard of what a Zoom party is, it's a wonderful way that technology brings people together where they can see each other in tiny little squares all around the screen. So happy birthday to Anne Gregory. One thing very special about Anne Gregory within the Cedarfield community is that she has two family members living here. Anne Gregory is the great granddaughter of Joyce Wilton, and she is also the granddaughter of Anne Smith. I learned today that Anne Smith's daughter-in-law is the granddaughter of Joyce Wilton. You just never know how people are connected. So happy birthday to beautiful Anne Gregory. Thank you.